So ladies and gentlemen, Dune is still on our minds. And one of the most memorable parts of the second movie is when Paul Atreides rode a massive worm. No pun intended. This wasn't a miracle though, as the freemen of that planet all have to survive and be able to accomplish this feat as sort of a ritual or a coming of age thing. We could see that in the latter parts of the movie, they all did that and they in fact used the gigantic worms as a type of train or a sort of a conveyor belt in order to traverse long distances in the planet, like going to the southern hemisphere to communicate and unite with the freemen tribes that flourished there. So here in this video, we will dive deep into how the freemen are able to use the Shai Halud as essentially vehicles of mass transportation and even weapons of war. So let's get to it. Before going into the process of riding a worm, again no pun intended, we first have to know the anatomy and morphology of the sandworms in order to get a clearer picture on how this feat can be accomplished. So the sandworms, as the name suggests, are long serpentine worm-like creatures which look like worms in appearance with a round mouth full of either frills or sharp teeth-like protrusions. They have a weird biochemical nature that includes some sort of a hot furnace in their digestive system and although they can live underground in the sands of dune, they cannot tolerate the entry of sand into their tissues and their mesodermal organs, which causes great irritation and sometimes with large amounts, it might even be lethal as it messes with their biochemistry. Therefore, to prevent this, they have developed thick scales that overlap each other and create a tight seal so as to not allow even the tiniest amount of sands from entering in. Thus, in short, they are gigantic worms with a very weird biology. These sandworms undergo through various stages in their life cycle from spice blows to minuscule sand trouts into growing into juveniles and then into adult sandworms. These worms are largely subterranean in nature and only come out to the surface to devour anything that makes regular and rhythmic sounds, sounds which are indicative of life, since nature is chaotic. These shyhalot are highly territorial and will fight other worms for space and dominance. So when humans walk around in the desert or when the harvesters gather spies, they create sounds of regular intervals which attract the sandworms that presume the origin of the sound to be from another worm that might be snatching a bit of its territory. And this is actually the first steps in riding a sandworm which we shall discuss here in a bit. Now how do we see the freemen ride the worms? Well from the movies, we see them hanging on to two ropes or two long sticks that are attached somehow to the skin of the worm and it looks like the freemen have mastered and tamed the godlike beings of the desert sands. But this is not as simple as it looks as there are various steps that must be followed sacredly in order to be able to just get on top of a worm. The first step is of course having the necessary tools. The first is the still suit which everyone must wear in Arrakis in order to survive the intense desert heat and the lack of moisture. Then for worm riding, there are two important tools. One is a thumper which creates loud rhythmic sounds to attract the worms and the other are the maker hooks, which are long narrow shafts with hooked endings that are used to attach to the scales of the worm. These three things and a sack full of iron balls are what's essential for worm riding. So this process of worm riding holds a deep significance among the freemen, symbolizing mastery over the harsh desert environment and marking a rider as a true member of their society, entitled to its rights and privileges. To ride a sandworm, a freeman would have first to judge a proper dune to stand on, one which is tall enough to allow the rider to jump on top of the worm when it surfaces. Then comes the part where the rider would summon it to the surface by using rhythmic vibrations, often created by a thumper. Once the massive worm emerges to swallow the thumper and breaks the dune, the rider would take a huge risk and jump on top of the worm and with the use of the maker hooks, the rider must pry open a scale or two in its body, allowing the sands to sift underneath. This action would irritate the worm, causing it to rotate or to roll the exposed scale upwards, keeping its body above the sand until the scale was back in place. A skilled freeman would then use the maker hooks to attach to the worm's mouth to control its lateral movement, pulling on the hooks to guide the worm in the desired directions. So there is a need for two hooks to turn the worm either right or left. Either way, a freeman can also do another thing. If he wants to turn right, he or she would pull harder on the left hook in order for the worm to bend towards the right, exposing the scale on the left side, therefore rolling to the right side. 
an instinctual movement to keep the exposed part as high as possible from the sands. And so to stabilize the movement, either the left hook would be eased down or the right hook would have to add more pressure and then expose the right side and then he would turn to the left. Alternatively, some freemen use worm charmers to summon the sandworms for riding. Sandworms have become a crucial method for travel for the freemen, with distances measured in terms of how many sandworm lengths a rider could travel before the worm became exhausted and submerged again. The origins of this worm riding begins with a small child. Here, as the tale goes, there was a small child named Selim, a banished child from one of the tribes in Arrakis. This tale served as an inspiration for Paul Atreides and many others. So in the sands of Dune, his movements attracted a giant worm, the movements of this child called Selim. While for most others, this would have been the end, a death sentence, but for Selim, it was but a challenge. His act of courage, quick thinking and by no chance a great deal of luck, he used his walking stick to pry open a scale and wound a sandworm, and then by using the stick, he was able to ride it safely. This feat earned him the name Worm Rider, and he became a legendary tale amongst his people. So Freeman typically learned the art of worm riding by the age of 12, as it is a crucial rite of passage and a fundamental aspect of their culture on this desert planet called Arrakis. This skill becomes a pivotal part of Paul Atreides' life as well, when he becomes involved in the Freeman tribe understanding that he must earn the trust of the freemen to fulfill his destiny as the Mahdi or the Kwisatz Hedrach or the Lisan Al-Gaib. Paul immerses himself in their ways, starting with learning on how to ride sandworms. Now, how are they used as mass transportation devices and how are they used as weapons of war? So the initial challenge in worm riding was, of course, for the first rider to safely summon, approach and attach the first hooks, and then to control the sandworm to maneuver it. Subsequent riders required less skill in handling the worm and more physical prowess to climb on its side. Characters like Jessica and Gurney would have had some trouble with the physical aspects of riding a worm, but with great risk they could be able to at least jump on top of the worm from a sand dune and then they would just ride it. In the book, it is mentioned that the freemen had a method for transportation for transporting older reverend mothers and very young children by using a basket or a sled. Paul Atreides, however, expressed a desire to ride the worm instead of being inside a basket or a sled, in order to be seen as a serious member and a potential leader among the freemen. It is still unclear though as to how the freemen would have placed a basket on the back of a sandworm, especially moving at great speeds, and how to put people inside of it. Additionally, pulling a sled behind a sandworm would be a challenging task due to the heat and intense dust shock waves that comes out from the worm's tail. But as weapons of war, the worms are essentially ridden into battle, maneuvered by the riders into the thick enemy formations as massive biological ramming vehicles. This would break the lines and create a lot of chaos, creating a lot of massive disarray to the enemy formations. Additionally, the durability of the sandworm scales against all types of weapons, including lasers and missiles, would prove vital in breaking enemy morale and routing the soldiers on the desert fields. It would take the might of atomic weaponry to stop these beasts dead in their tracks, but since atomics are largely discouraged or even banned in open warfare in Dune, these worms would be likely unstoppable forces of nature that will be seen to have seemingly allied with the freemen. This sight of the worms and the freemen together would break any troops' morale. And so of course, after the riders have retracted the hooks after the battle, the worms would go back to the sands and dive back down on the ground. And this, my friends, is how a sandworm is fully utilized and ridden. Now we have come to the end of the video on how the freemen rode the sandworms in Dune. So if you like this one, then watch this other one as well. And do check out our channel for other Dune content. Like, subscribe and we'll see you in the next video. Take care, fam.